What's going on, church family? Hey, I just wanted to post a quick video just sharing some experiences that I've been having in the last week. Uh, as I continue to pray that God would help me to live sent uh, before this community, he's also helping me uh, to just, I believe, remain an example before the body. Uh, the Bible says to pastor specifically to be an example to the flock, and that's a really big desire of mine as it pertains to not only just godly living, but also just pushing forward this vision of living sin, finding opportunities to invest in people, to meet with people, to evangelize to people, to disciple people one-on-one. -on -one. And in the last week, I've had three different occurrences that are Holy Spirit-born, Holy Spirit-given, that I just have to share with you for a minute. So, number one, uh, I started teaching the Gospels class on campus at OU this past Thursday, and we worked all the way through the beginning of Matthew, all the way to Matthew chapter 5, to the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. But in fact, actually, before I got to the book of Matthew, I had this opportunity to just teach on the Old Testament prophecies about the coming Messiah, but I didn't tell the class that those were Old Testament prophecies. I was just having them tell me what they're learning about Jesus. And the Old Testament prophecies were so obvious that they said, well, it says this about Jesus, that about Jesus. And it was really cool because by the end of that teaching, I got to say, now guys, these prophecies were all written before Jesus ever came. These prophecies were written before crucifixion even existed yet. These prophecies deal with his genealogy, with how he would look, how he would act, how you know, the things he would accomplish. And I said there's about 269 of those specifically in the Old Testament. And it was amazing just having this opportunity to teach the Bible to these students. And I understand not everybody's going to have that opportunity, but, you know, a light, what I am trying to say is a light bulb went off when I was able to show them the incredible divine nature of the Bible. You know, some people discredit or disbelieve the Bible, but when you start showing them what the Bible says specifically, when you are prepared to know which passage to point them to, it really does have an effect on people's hearts. I, you could see the whole mood and the class change, and I think that's just what God's Word should do to us. After class, I had an interaction with a student uh, who will remain unnamed, but it was an amazing interaction. He, he said that he was an atheist and we ended up talking for an entire hour after class, and all I appealed to was the organized world that we live in. You cannot conduct science without organization. You cannot conduct mathematics without organization. You cannot have a purpose to history. You cannot participate in English, which is dependent upon knowledge and information to read and to write and to communicate. You cannot have those things unless you're living inside of God's world, God's design, God's playground. And if you seek to break outside of those organi uh, that organized world, then you have to neglect all educational principles. You have to neglect all English, all history, all math, all science, because you no longer live in the organized world that you've neglected. So I got to work with him on that and just share with him that just the existence of logic alone, rationality, the fact that Somehow this piece of meat inside my school called a brain is bringing about rationalistic, non-material thoughts, which I cannot touch. Right now, if I said, look at your bedroom, everybody listening to this video would be able to picture in their mind what their bedroom looks like currently. But you can't touch it, you can't grab it, but that's happening through this piece of meat that's just so somehow producing this non-material image in your head. Listen. God has created us as logical, rational, special human beings. So unless you do away with organization and unless you do away with logic, you cannot get away from the fact that you are living in God's world. That's the argumentation that I get to give to my student, to my friend, and it was just so rich because in order to combat the existence of God, you have to stop using organization and you have to stop using logic, and good luck with that right? So it is such an opportunity to be on campus, to not just point them to the existence of God, by the way, but to point them to the fact that because God exists, he has made himself known. And if he has made himself known, then he has given us information to make himself known, which would be the Bible. And is the Bible reliable? Is it reliable? The Bible credible? 
well, if we're just going to take prophecy alone, then we know that, yes, it is. Therefore, God has communicated with us who he is, and the gospel is true, and Jesus saves. So, you know, when I think about making sure that we're prepared to reach lost people, a part of it, church family, is this. You need to be confident in what you believe. Truth is on our side, and yet sometimes I feel like we lose a a passion for the truth because we live in a pluralistic world where everybody's opinion is supposed to be right and kept to themselves and preserved preserved as sacred. But look, people are equal, but ideas are not equal. And when we think about the gospel, Jesus said that he himself is the way and the truth and the life. I just want to encourage you, church family, if what you believe is correct, it will stand under the, the test of every critic and skeptic that there is. It will stand the test of time. Things are true, timelessly speaking. Things are true, eternally speaking. Which means if you really do have the truth in your hand, then the truth will never leave your hand. The truth is not something we create. The truth is something that we discover. God has given us his truth to discover, not to recreate for ourselves. So I just want to encourage you, the truth is already before our eyes. We just have to discover it. Other people, other non-believers, they're... They're wasting their time recreating truth. And that's what Adam and Eve did after they decided to not follow the God of truth in the garden. We don't have to recreate truth. It's already there to be discovered. It's handed to us. So I just want to encourage you with that. In that interaction, I just felt like the Holy Spirit gave me confidence. And he can give that confidence to you too. And I want you to walk in confidence. Another interaction that I had uh, the other day, myself, uh, Christy Christy Ninemeyer and her friend Cameron, we went out. Uh, During the night of prayer a few weeks back, we came across a man named John and his wife named Peggy. Peggy has cancer. They live on 19th Street, and they're somewhat neighbors of mine. And we had an incredible interaction just being able to pray for them and meet them. It was just a a God-inspired moment. And you know what happened? I took my kids to Mugshot, and I got some coffee, and there was John and Peggy in the parking lot. And I got to talk to him about the gospel yet again. So... You know, when we reach our community, other gospel opportunities will keep coming up. But we just have to be ready to say something and be ready to sincerely love people, to engage them in conversation, to see how they're doing. This can be the culture of Ottawa Bible Church, the culture of when we see someone that breaks our heart, when we see someone that's typically overlooked, we make sure we engage them with the love of Jesus Christ and see if we can strike up a conversation that eventually gets to the gospel. Rather than not trying, I wonder what would happen if we just tried more. And even if it was an awkward encounter, an awkward of, hey, how you doing today? Who cares if it's awkward? Just take the risk and go talk to somebody and do it in obedience to God with his love and he's gonna make something out of it. The last story that I have to share is my family and I on Sunday night went to the Second Street Dam and. We got to walk across the bridge, and, you know, I think it's behind there, behind the cemetery, behind the baseball fields. And there was this young man there just eating dinner, <laughs> sitting at, at, at the river or, you know, just sitting by himself near the creek. And it was amazing how within 30 seconds we started talking about the gospel. All it took was, hey, where do you go to school? And he says, oh, I, I do. I go to Ottawa. And I said, where are you from? He says, I'm from Kansas City. And And then I said, you know, I actually just started teaching at the university. (laughs) And he said, do you really? What class are you teaching? And I said, actually, I'm teaching the Gospels class. He said, oh, my roommates have you as their teacher. He said, man, I took that class a year ago, and I'm still trying to figure out what the class was all about. I'm still trying to figure out what the Gospel is. Within about 30 seconds, maybe a minute, he actually used the words, and he said, I've just been looking for somebody to teach me what all of this stuff is about. I'm, I'm trying to figure it out myself. I don't, I don't really understand who Jesus is. I heard he committed miracles or something, but I need somebody to help me understand. Just like that, a minute into the conversation. And then we got to talking about grace, and I explained the difference between mercy and grace and how if it's not for the grace of God, the favor of God, the blessings of God, when you don't deserve it, if it's not for the grace of God, then a, a person can't be saved. You don't become a Christian by being more religious. You become saved by depending on the grace of God alone, what he's done for you, by repenting of your sins and placing your faith in Jesus. Like, that's how you get the grace of God. And he said, wait a minute, so grace is kind of like this, where he was regurgitating to me the biblical definition of grace after I talked to him. And I said, yeah, that's grace. And he said, oh my gosh, I've, I've never heard of this before. 
church family, he's never heard of grace before. Uh, I'm so desperate. I am desperate in a healthy way, in a very healthy way. I am so desperate to see the lost reached in our town. If you know what grace is, the only prayer you have left to pray is, God, give me courage to communicate that grace to people who don't know it. That is your only job, to hand over the grace you've been given, to share that message with others, to build relationships that are bent towards that direction. Not for the sake of getting a notch under your belt because you want to lead somebody to Christ. No, because God says so, because it's right for us to love to love people and to invade their life with the good news. This isn't bad news. This is good news that will wreck their bad life. This is good news that will disrupt their sin lifestyle. This is great news, healthy news, eternally saving news that will save them from hell. So it will invade, it will disrupt, but eternally for the better. So church family, this is just my moment. Um, I didn't plan on sharing this video today, but I am so stirred right now in my heart where I want nothing more than for us to not be about ourselves and for us to be about those in this community. Uh, Jesus said that we should discern the times just as we should discern the seasons of the year. You know, it's turning fall, it's turning winter, it's turning spring, it's turning summer. Just as Jesus said, you see the leaves changing and you can discern the seasons, so we should be able to discern the times. And if we can discern the times, then we can discern that Jesus is coming back. If the world is moving in the direction it's going, Jesus is getting closer and closer to his return. And church family, Jesus will say to us, well done, good and faithful servants, when we do something with the grace given to us, afforded to us, when we are self-sacrificial to where we're not inward focused, but we are outward focused. I so badly want to love those people who are lost. And I want us to as well. This is what it looks like to build a culture of evangelism where in a culture of evangelism, it becomes our burden and our heart's desire to not worry about the minor things we could complain about, but instead to have a healthy discontentment about not reaching enough people, to have a healthy, passionate desire to reach the lost, to make disciples, mature them in the faith, um, and multiply them to send them out. Pray for our college students as well, that they would be reached. Pray for the new families coming to our church. We're a growing church right now through a pandemic, and I believe with all my heart it's because of the preaching of the Word of God. So continue to pray for your church, church family. Continue to pray that the grace of God would move your heart to do something radical that you would have never done before. And may it be with joy and willingness in the Holy Spirit. And may you'll, you be okay with the journey and the adventure and the unknown and the ride of it all, because that's where God is glorified. Hey, church family, I'm speaking for you in love. I'm yet again wanting to cast this vision. This is where we need to go. This is better yet who we need to become. Our vision of who we are aiming to be is to live sent by the grace of God alone. I love you guys. Have a great week.